Thank you very much, uh, Lee. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's my pleasure to be presenting a bit of a Canadian perspective on performance-based seismic design. So we'll start with a bit of an introduction. It was back in 2014 that the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code implemented performance-based design. To my knowledge, this is the first document that brought in performance-based design as a complete sort of framework. Up until 2006, I'm going to move away. I think there's a bit of echo coming here. Uh, up until 2006, we were fully force-based, albeit in British Columbia, we were doing most new designs and definitely seismic retrofits to at least two levels, and they were displacement-based, and we were looking at at strains and capacity protection goes goes without saying. In 2019, which is the most recent edition, we've uh, tried to improve upon some of the provisions. There were some inconsistencies uh, that were obvious to certain people, not obvious to certain others. There was some research, and when Lee was describing some of the research here, um, I could see that some of the things we found there were bang on. So it was very good to hear that. Um, it's usually the strain limit um, at, at the no damage or immediate recover our immediate uh, performance that governs. That was good to see. Uh, we're trying to improve upon uh, the new version, which comes out in, in 2025. I'm part of that code committee. Uh, there's lots of debates happening. Um, I won't say too much about it at this point because it's, it's work in progress. Some of the other important documents, and I'll touch, touch upon the first one there, is the BCMOTI supplement. So just as WashDOT has its own manual in other jurisdictions, Caltrans has their own seismic design criteria. The MOTI comes out with a supplement. Um, with COVID and stuff, it's taken them some, some time, and it just came out in July of this year. And then there is a uh, engineers and geoscientists of BC publication, performance-based seismic design of bridges, which is meant to be followed, and I had some involvement in that for a few years. Okay, I took the liberty um, to do this. Hopefully this isn't infringing on copyright, <laughs> but um, and I swear there was a slide where I tried to do a little bit of a, a flow chart and it's disappeared somehow when I looked at it after putting it on there. But anyways, um, what we are calling bridge operational categories are known as bridge importance classification. And you can pretty much draw a one on one analogy here uh, for critical. We have lifeline. For recovery, we call that major route, and ordinary bridges are referred to as other in, um, in the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code. Then when we look at the life safety operational and fully operational performance levels, in, in the uh, Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code, we've actually got four levels instead of three. Um, and I tried to keep them in the same uh, sort of order, even though in the code, the order is reversed. So the code starts with immediate performance or immediate service, minimal damage, and then kind of goes to higher damage states. But anyways, starting at the high end, uh, which is the most damage and the, and the least service level or the lowest service level, we're starting with life safety, which is the service and the damage is probable replacement. We go to service disruption, extensive damage, limited and repairable damage and immediate minimal damage. We have uh, three levels at this point. Um, I will put a bit of a caveat there. So even though we're looking at three levels, which are the 475, 975, and 2475, when we look at a bridge, depending on various other factors, it's only two that come in. So overall, there are three levels. But for any given structure, you'll only be looking at two. Seismic performance categories, we have three at this point. And these are based on spectral acceleration values. And I was, when I was going through the AASHTO guidelines document, I was kind of scratching my head because I confused the seismic hazard level with the earthquake ground motion level. And I was thinking to myself, what does that mean? And then I clued in, basically, it's, um, it's the SD1 value, which AASHTO has. So it's tied to the fundamental uh, period, uh, one second period. But in the Canadian Highway Code, it's tied to two fundamental uh, period values. So you either your fundamental period is 0.5 seconds or less, 
And that's when we're tied to, instead of SD1, you could say that we're tied to SD.2. So that's what we call S.2, and that is site-specific. So you've got to change the basic site category C to whatever you're in. And for a, for a higher period, larger than 0.5, then we're back to S1.0. And this gets related to bridge importance category, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so as I was saying, there are three categories, one, two, and three. For seismic performance category one, no seismic analysis is required. Uh, what you do need to do is you just need to provide some detailing, which is in line with seismic category, seismic performance category two. But for one, we don't do any seismic analysis. Okay, so I have left out the line um, which gives you the, um, the seismic performance category one for both lifeline and major root or other bridges, but this is where it gets split up. If your fundamental period is below 0.5 seconds and your S.2 value is between 0.2 and 0.35, whether your lifeline or major root and other will give you the seismic performance category. Okay, so let's say that I am in a situation where I have a major root bridge and my fundamental period is say 0.6 seconds, I will go to the very last line if my, my S1.0 is larger than 0.3 and my category would be 3. Okay, so it's a pretty simple table to read and go off. Let me talk a little bit about the importance categories. Uh, I described there's, there are three of them, very similar to what Ashto has. And this is what the commentary says. It again, the purpose for this is to provide the owners and regulating agencies to have the ability to prioritize and risk manage. This is where the conversation starts as the esteemed speakers before me have been talking about. So the idea is to be able to facilitate your emergency response recovery and uh, figure out the impact on your available resources. So I'll start with the other category, which is the uh, lowest importance. These would be bridges that would be on minor and local routes. Um, they may have redundant access, they may not have redundant access, but the big point is that their impact would be limited to small areas, not, not large regions. Moving on to the major route, these are required more for immediate post-earthquake emergency response and movement of peoples and goods. Uh, restricted functionality would be then uh, impacting a larger region, and you would be impacting regional commerce and economic recovery overall. Lifeline structures would be uh, large structures where you would need additional money and resources, they're complex, and if you have to restore their functionality, you would need more resources, more time, specialized personnel to do that. They may not be route dependent, but likely they're gonna be on a major route, and they would have serious implications for public safety and regional security. Here are a couple of examples. This is the big Port Man Bridge on Trans-Canada Highway, about 15 kilometers west of where I am. Multi-billion dollar bridge. So it's the same highway, and this is, this was designated by the ministry as a lifeline bridge. This carries the highway. East of that, about, um, sorry, west of that again, about 20 kilometers from that bridge is the Wellington Avenue interchange. So now Trans Canada is going underneath. This was designated as a major route bridge. However, it's again up to the owner to decide what they want to do. On the big Champlain project in Montreal, where there is a big cable state bridge, and all these highway bridges, they designated the entire route as lifeline. So all, even the single or two span highway bridges had to be designed for the lifeline performance. So it really depends on how the owner views their asset inventory and what they're gonna do with it. And just, just a very quick caveat, uh, I'm not sure about the US, but in Canada, the bridge design code is not a matter of law, it's a matter of contract. So again, you can change things, and it comes in through a matter of contract. So the owner says, thou shall use this, and Manitoba is an example which traditionally uses Ashto. They don't use S6. Okay, so like we were talking about bridge attributes earlier, um, there is a bridge regularity clause in there, and it looks at what they would call a regular bridge, six spans, small skew angles or subtended angles, and certain ratios 
for adjacent spans for maximum length or uh, bent to peer stiffness ratios. So the second last line from the bottom is just going to deal with, because you're up to six spans with five span ratios. And then with uh, bent to peer stiffnesses, it's anywhere from three to six spans, because two spans would just mean one bent. And so if you have a continuous bridge and it's, um, say, four spans, you cannot go beyond a stiffness ratio of four. If you're continuous, if you're simple, you have to stick to 1.25 no matter how many spans you have. Okay, so here comes the, the big question in the code. You can do performance-based design for all the bridges you want, but the minimum bar is set by the code, and in certain instances, we can do force-based design if certain conditions are met. Okay, so performance-based design when it comes to lifeline bridges, of course, there's no requirement for SPC1. For SPC2 and 3, whether you're an irregular bridge or a regular bridge, you have to do performance-based design. Moving on to major root bridges, so you can see a pattern, a trend here. SPC2 and 3, an irregular for major root bridges. So it's a slight, it's, it's a fairly important bridge type, and you have this irregularity in there, and SPC 2 and 3, which means you have high seismic risk, you're going to be have, you're going to have to do performance-based design. For force, for SPC 2 for a regular bridge in major route, you can do force-based design. But when you go to SPC 3, even if it is regular for a major route, you're going to have to do performance-based design. Then for other bridges, which is the least important, you can do a force-based design if you're regular for both categories 2 and 3. And you can also do it for an irregular bridge if you're an SPC2. However, if you're an SPC3 and you're irregular, you're going to have to do performance-based design. Just very quickly, I want to throw some nomenclature here before I go into analysis requirements. ESA is the elastic, is the equivalent static analysis. There are two, um, two methods given, the uniform load method and the single mode. EDA is the multimodal response spectrum analysis. Then you have the nonlinear pushover analysis called the inelastic static pushover and the nonlinear time history. So those um, acronyms you'll see in the code. So I want to just point out the analysis requirements. There are two tables. One is applicable to 2% and 5%, and the other one is applicable to 10%, which I've left out. The only time we require knowledge in time history analysis is when we are lifeline and irregular for both SPC2 and 3. Everywhere else, you're going to have to use um, an elastic dynamic analysis and ISPA. So I think there is a little bit of um, some thought that needs to be given to, say, the major root regular SPC2 because we're only requiring an ESA. I don't think you can do performance-based design without doing a pushover unless things are fully elastic, in which case you don't need to go and look at all the strain demands and what have you. So uh, those are some of the, the things that we're looking at and trying to make everything consistent. Okay. Um, I just pointed out that uh, we've got three seismic events, the 2% in 50 years, 5% in 50 years, and 10% in 50 years. But for any given bridge, we're only looking at two categories. Okay, so Lifeline has no requirements for a 475-year return period event because at 5% in 50 years, the performance is immediate, service and minimal damage. So this is where you're going to be essentially elastic. For 2% in 50 years, we're at service limited and repairable damage, which means your strains are going to be quite low. You're going to allow some, some rebar to heal. Maybe it's going to come up to about 0.01 in terms of strain. You're going to allow perhaps your uh, cover concrete to fall, but nothing beyond that. For major root, um, now it's 10% in 50 years. Um, that's incorrect. That's 5% in 50 years. Uh, sorry. Um, what's incorrect is 975. Should say 475 years. So now instead of having the minimal damage at uh, 975, it's pinned to, to 475, so it's a, it's a lower demand. And 2% in 50 years is not at repairable damage, but it gives you a, a bit more leeway. We're allowed to go up to extensive damage. And again, there are some strain limits, which I'll quickly point to, that are required to show explicit demonstration 
uh, no 975 year requirements for this. Same thing here, no 975 year return period event, so that 475 is, uh, 975 at the top should be corrected. Now we're at service limited for the other bridge and repairable damage, and we go all the way to life safety uh, and probable replacement for the 2475 if you have an other bridge. Okay, what I like about the ASHTO guidelines is um, you don't have these blanket values and there is some consideration given to the axle load and how far you're going, how far you're pushing your system. For now we've got these, uh, these straight up values. For the uh, minimal damage, uh, we're allowing the cover concrete to go up to 0 0.006, not sure why. I, I believe it should be close to 0 0.004, but that's more general, it's falling. It doesn't really change the fact that your contractor will go out and, and maybe just chip that concrete out completely and put something around it and, and grout and be on, on their way. Um, in the 2014 version, we had that Epsilon S, the steel rebar strain setting at 0 0.002. And as soon as, as soon as I saw that, I was alarmed because you just cannot design that. So, uh, through UBC, we did some research, and, to, and it was governing everywhere. For a 475.002, you, you were having to put in about 6% required. I said, the contract doesn't gonna kill you. Um, anyway, so we were able to, to change that to 0 0.01, which is very similar to what, what the ASHTO guidelines were showing. For repairable uh, damage state, we're at 0 0.025. For extensive, this is where the cover concrete comes in. So you'll see for repairable, there is no cover con or no um, no core concrete values given because the cover has fallen off. For extensive, you're only allowed to you're allowed to go to 85% of the mandrel confined model. I see that um, Ashto has 1.4 times that, uh, but this is straight up mandrel confined. For steel, we're allowing to go to 0 0.05. For probable replacement, we're allowing to go all the way up to the mandrel confined concrete for the co for the co concrete core, and then that comes straight out of the Caltrans criteria, the 0 0.075 for steel, except for 35 mm larger bars, which I believe are number 11, um, close to that, for which we have a lower limit. Now the code does give uh, some qualitative measures and descriptions for connections and bearings and joints, restrainers, foundation movements and span alignments and approach settlement. And I'm, I'm actually very happy to see that there are more prescriptive values given in uh, the ASHTO guidelines. Um, I'm going to take take those back to, to our committee and say we should have a chat about that. It, what, what I find with uh, the Canadian thinking is that sometimes we leave too much to imagination in our in our um, quest to, to have the engineers have their leeway. Um, and I kind of see that the US does a bit more of a mandate that you've got to do this. Uh, they both have their pros and cons. And there is still, uh, there are a couple of people in our committee that want no strain limits in there. And they say, if you're doing performance-based design, you shall not make it prescriptive. Um, I see a, a, an issue with that is then you can get into lots of legal issues um, with the owners interpreting things different way. Uh, yes, the, the idea is to keep the door open to more novel materials to more, to cover more, but you can, act, you can go too far the other way too, I think. Okay, just uh, sort of towards the end, I want to touch upon the MOTI supplement, um, which just came out. And usually the supplement sets the stage for the next Canadian code because BC tends to be sort of at the forefront of practice in Canada. The other area that, that is somewhat concerned about seismic is the Ottawa, Montreal area, which has um, uh, some seismic issues. The, the thing there is that they have a lot of high energy in the short period range. So as soon as you hit 0.5 seconds, it just drops off very quickly. And the projects I've been involved with, they're, they're usually governed by non-seismic design some capacity protection and you're, you're done. So unless you have a really short period, 0.3 second locked in bridge that's going to all of a sudden do something funky and have a very high ductility demand, uh, you might need to look at it and it might be governed by seismic, but usually it's, um, 
it, it drops very, very quickly. There is a factor of about 11 or something in terms of that sort of energy difference at the short period. Um, but overall, what I was surprised about was that New Madrid actually takes over California. In, in Canada, um, nothing ever takes over BC. It's just we're sitting very, very comp like comparable to the Northwest, uh, but much higher than the rest of the country. Okay, so the, the sixth generation seismic hazard has come out. Um, NBCC, the National Building Code of Canada, had been in the works the 2020, and that also got delayed by at least a couple of years, just came out. And the ministry is now looking at uh, the sixth generation seismic hazard. I think they've either mandated it or they're mandating it right now, even though in the code, you've got the fifth generation, uh, but it, that won't change until the next one comes out. But site class F for NBCC, the new one that's come out, is described as um, something that has the VS30, the shear wave velocity less than 140 meters per second. There's the blow count and the, uh, the shear strength for the soil. So the ministry and their supplement are saying, if you have that condition, you have to talk to us. And, and we will, in consultation with us, you, you have to describe to us what type of analysis you've done to kind of categorize that. And we have to consent to it. Okay. Liquefaction-wise, uh, they're overriding everything. They're saying if you have liquefaction, doesn't matter what the code says, you have to do performance-based design. And I think that's a good thing to do. And the minimum you have to do is do a, a multimodal response spectrum analysis and uh, a pushover analysis if you're in liquefiable soils. This has been a big, uh, big debate in BC projects on the Evergreen Line, which is a transit project which I was involved in 2012 to 2014. It's liquefaction everywhere. It's liquefaction galore. And the big issue there is big thick crust sitting on top of deep deep seeded liquefactions that became very, very difficult to just say, oh, we're just going to look at uh, inertial effects and not worry about kinematic at all, and also then how to combine them. And I think around that same time, there was a, a Caltrans document that came out that showed that, you know, perhaps using 100% of kinematic and 50% of inertial is not a bad place to be. And that's what the ministry has been kind of mandating in their projects on a project by project basis. But now this has come into, the, uh, into their supplement officially. Okay, so one has to look at 100% of inertial and then 100% of kinematic plus 50% of inertial. I won't go into how we would combine those, but the least you need to do is do a push-over um, uh, on the, on the uh, superstructure and then have to combine it with some of the faction effects, with some funky boundary conditions, et cetera, et cetera unless you go full on flack or whatever, but <laughs> we won't go there. Um, this is an important point and I, um, this is where I've been talking to the committee a little bit. There's no equivalent nonlinear static procedure right now. It is straight up equal displacement principle. Do your response spectrum analysis, get your displacement demand, which is the elastic demand. There's no, not even like that coefficient that Lee was pointing out and run your pushover to that point and of course, you'd have multiple points if you're looking at multiple events. And then figure out your strain limits and all of that, and then do your capacity protective design. Everything else is the same. You need to converge your soil springs. All of that stuff goes without saying. There has been some confusion as to what material properties we would use. Uh, the next code um, is, is trying to address that, but the ministry is clearly specifying use expected material properties. Something we've had for a while uh, in our code and still continues to be there, and I think that's not a bad thing, is adding some live load demands in that displaced um, shape and figuring out what your performance is going to be. So you're putting it, but I didn't, I didn't put all of that there, but it's 100% of live load without dynamic load allowance for minimal damage, and then it goes to 50%, and it goes to 30% for probable replacement, just so you can sure, make sure that uh, the traffic and kind of safely drive off whatever is on there. Okay, um, now sometimes, as we know, elastic design is uh, unavoidable on a big cable state bridge or big, big gigantic pylons. If you try to capacity protect your piles, I've tried it twice or three times, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, this is, I think, where the code is going to go. 
and it might have come from an American source, it might have been Ashto, but this is where we are right now in the ministry supplement. Factor up your elastic demands by 25, 35, and 50 percent for other major root and lifeline groups. We have had uh, some talk about how to calculate shear capacities, um, and people have been doing it in various ways. Dr. Priestley's methodology, going back to his 1998 book. Um, the ministry supplement has brought in the methodology by Priestley, um, uh, Calvi, and Dr. Kowalski from the book, 2007. It's still left open-ended, and they say, you know, you've got to use a refined method where you're actually accounting for uh, the uh, the plastic hinge demands and the curvature difficulties and all that. So reduce your your concrete based on that your concrete capacity. But this is given as one example that we can use. And I think this is probably the one of the last points. The code does not have any concrete or steel pile strain values, but the supplement has brought in some of those, and um, those we will have to now. Uh, explicitly show. That's not to say that we haven't looked at those before. On certain projects we've been using ABC 49 limits in the past with liquefiable deep-seated uh, engine. Otherwise, engine is not allowed, which I think is the same in, in the US. One point I want to make is the steel substructure design, and I think there was a point up there It definitely needs more research. Right now, when you read S619, it keeps referring things back to S1619, which is the the building's code, and there, whether you have an, a concentrically braced frame or an eccentrically braced frame or a moment resistant frame, the building code talks about R values. So it's force based. There's some language in the bridge code that talks about performance, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, you refer back to the building code. So that's definitely something that we would like to improve upon. Now, it's only Japan, to my knowledge, where I see steel vents all the time. Um, I haven't seen them in North America very often, and that's probably why this thing is lagging behind. We did a little bit of research on an eccentrically braced frame with UVC. Um, that's probably Gavin's best stumble, but we had some findings, and I'd be happy to share if anyone's interested. 